Hey, you wonderful, amazing students. How are you? <clears throat> Today we're going to talk about the independence of Brazil. So fasten your seats and hang on. Here we go. The independence of Brazil from taken from Thomas Skidmore, Brazil, Five Centuries of Change. We're in Chapter 3. The independence of Brazil from 1750 to 1830. So the outline will be, we'll first talk about the economics and politics of post-1750 Brazil. 1750 was the end of uh, our analysis of the colonial period. And 1750 signaled major changes in the administration of colonial territories in Spanish America and Portuguese America under the influence of the Enlightenment thinkers and Royal absolutism and reform, bureaucratic reform. So the subheads under this uh, section will be tensions in the late 18th century, and they certainly were some, and conspiracies against the Portuguese. And then the second part, we'll talk about the Portuguese court, that is the royal court, comes to Brazil. One of the most amazing stories in all of history. And the subheadings under that will be the creating of a new Portuguese America, social hierarchies, and the new monarchical system. So let's dive in. The elite of colonial Brazil increasingly came to see their interests, both economic and political, as separate from those from the Kingdom of Portugal. This culminated in the Portuguese crown moving its base from Portugal to Brazil in 1808. An incredible story. And the eventual setting up of a member of the Portuguese royal family as the emperor of an independent Brazil. This is the one and only time this happened in the Americas, and it's a uh, unique story. So many things about Brazilian history is unique and different from any other country in the Americas. <coughs> oh, strong, <coughs> strong coffee, sorry. The Brazilian expansion west and south continued during this time period. And in the south, the conflict with the Spanish was largely ended by the Treaty of Madrid in 1715, which in which Spain agreed to recognize the Portuguese claim to all the areas they had effectively occupied. Portugal took took possession, legal possession, based on actual position. This treaty legitimized Portugal's claim to all the territories that it occupied west of the imaginary line drawn by the Treaty of Torcedillas back in 1494. This includes the Amazon Basin, parts of Mato Grosso, along with chunks of São Paulo, Paraná, Santa Catarina, and all of Rio Grande do Sul. The Marquis de Pombal, who was the effective Prime Minister of Portugal during much of this time, and was very much a royal absolutist, and was influ influenced by the rationalism of the Enlightenment. In 1750, control of all the policies of the Portuguese crown went to the Marquis de Pombal. He, came the, he became the de facto Prime Minister of Portugal, including the uh, Portuguese colonies in the Americas from 1750 to 1777. If you've watched the movie The Mission with Robert De Niro, a great movie, uh, it takes place during this time period, and uh, it makes a uh, indirect reference to the Treaty of uh, the Treaty of Madrid. His goal was to bring enlightened despotism to Portugal as a means of restoring its economic health. Remember, Portugal is a small, tiny country with only about a million inhabitants. It was not particularly prosperous or particularly wealthy. Uh, so the Portuguese achievements in colonialism was absolutely amazing. They uh, were actually ahead of the Spanish and were the first European uh, country to establish a worldwide empire all the way to India and in the Americas. But they were not doing well economically by this time. Pombal was a mercantilist following the predominant economic theory of the period. 
mercantilism is the economic theory that preceded laissez-faire capitalism and Adam Smith uh, around 1776 actually is when he published his book The Wealth of Nations. Before that the dominant economic theory was mercantilism which believed that the function of colonies like Brazil was purely to continue to produce primary goods for export to the home country. In other words the colonies existed uh, only for the benefit of the mother country, end of story. That's mercantilism. So tensions began to build in the 18th century. Uh, this coincided with the kind of late arrival of the Enlightenment to the Americas. The Enlightenment actually began in the 17th, late 17th century. And by the mid-18th century, the Portuguese America, like other European colonies in the Americas, was feeling the influence of these ideas. The 17th century had seen an intellectual revolution in Europe, especially in France and England, as thinkers such as Descartes and Newton challenged established ideas and authority. Their weapons were reason and measurement, as they preached the virtues of experimentation and observation. So this was a scientific revolution as well as an enlightenment, as it's called, the age of reason. Aided by newly developed type of mathematics, calculus, the Enlightenment, uh, the Enlightenment scientists were opening a whole new understanding of the physical world. By the way, I've seen a meme circulating during this last year and a half of COVID pandemic, which says that, uh, which observes that Newton invented calculus during the Black Plague. And that's how bored he was, uh, cooped up and quarantined in his place well i don't think that's he was bored but it's kind of funny that the, he would be driven to invent something like calculus during a uh, pandemic ho ho i'm going to try some more coffee if it's not too strong to choke me up this time education in portugal uh that one of the things that the portuguese attempted to do to prevent enlightenment ideas to spread to brazil was to prohibit the use of printing presses and universities. So unlike Spanish America in Mexico and the city of Mexico and in Lima, you had universities. Bogota had a university going way back. But uh, Brazil or Portuguese America had no universities and no printing presses. They couldn't print a book in Brazil. It had to be brought over from Portugal. And their young people couldn't get an education in Brazil, not not an advanced education. They had to go to the University of Coimbra, uh, which was the most famous and influential in Portugal. 300 Brazilian-born students enrolled between 772 and 1785. Once in Portugal, they were exposed directly or indirectly to French influence. And during this period of tension, there began to be some conspiracies against the Portuguese by native Brazilians. The most famous, perhaps, is the Inconfidencia in 1788. Uh, uh, Inconfidencia is just another word for conspiracy. It was the first serious anti-Portuguese plot in Minas Gerais. In 1788, a group of prominent citizens in Oro Preto, a plan to assassinate the governor and proclaim an independent republic. And one of these uh, conspirators was Jose Joaquim de Maya, who communicated with Thomas Jefferson, first by letter, then in person in a visit in France, requesting U.S. support for the revolt. Notice the time period is roughly the same time period as the independence of the United States. Uh, another one of the conspirators was a mulatto named Joaquim José da Silva Xavier. Uh, he was an amateur dentist, so he got the nickname Chiradentes, Chiradentes, tooth puller. Uh, he was one. He was the only one of non-aristocrats among the leadership, which means when the full weight, the full brutal weight of the penalty fell, it fell on him almost exclusively. When the crackdown came, his more distinguished co-conspirators scrambled to deny or cover up their involvement. Chidenches faced the gallows on April 21st, 1792. After being hanged, he was decapitated and his head displayed on a pole in the center of Oro Preto. 
such as the luck of a, uh, or the poor luck or the bad luck of a mulatto or a person of color in Brazil in this time period. The, uh, the next conspiracy was the Bahian Conspiracy in 1798. This has been called Brazil's first social revolution because it was organized by people from the uh, rising middle class or working class, organized by artisans, soldiers, sharecroppers, and school teachers, and the plotters were overwhelmingly mulatto this time instead of aristocrats, reflecting the predominant racial makeup of such economic groups. Not the elite, but certainly not the have-nots of colonial Brazil. In August 1798, they posted handwritten manifestos on walls and public places demanding the end of the detestable metropolitan yoke of Portugal, the abolition of slavery, and the equality of all citizens, especially mulatos and blacks. Their government was to be democratic, free, and independent noble ideals and you can see why they may feel some sympathy for the uh, new united states and its war of independence from great britain uh let me back up one second i just want to mention that there's uh, three characteristics of a revolution by which you can you can evaluate or uh, judge discern engage with a, a revolution uh, one is political revolution, the second is economic revolution, and the third is social revolution. So, the, for example, the American Revolution, or the United States War of Rebellion against uh, Great Britain, was only political. The uh, British overlords were removed and replaced by large landowners and elites in the United States who were colonists. So that's a political revolution. Uh, but it didn't have an the same people had this had the same money at the end of that as as at the beginning and there was no overturning of the social order so it was not let us say it was not a full-blown revolution it was more of a uh, political change uh, the mexican revolution was an example of one that was political but it also eventually became economic and not so much economic social for sure the uh, Creole, white Creole elites were removed and replaced by Mestizo rulers. There was some uh, redistribution of land and some economic aspects, but not entirely. The Haitian Revolution, on the other hand, was a full-blown revolution, political, uh, economic, and social. Uh, at the beginning, you had uh, white French landowners, and at the end, you had uh, mulattoes and black former slaves who were free and in control of their own government and the uh the uh planta sugar plantation system was completely destroyed and abolished as a uh economic source unfortunately they were never able to come up with a economic alternative so this is a way you can look at a a, a coup attempt or a revolution or a rebellion and evaluate how much how how extreme of a revolution it is. The Portuguese, Portuguese court comes to Brazil in 1807. The, uh, the uh, war was, the Napoleonic Wars were still going on. Um, this upheaval had begun in, 19, in 1791 with the French Revolution, basically at the same time as the Haitian Revolution. Napoleon eventually took took charge and became the strongman authoritarian leader of the French Revolution. Uh, some would argue that the French Revolution was over by that time. However, the Enlightenment ideals carried on into the Napoleonic era, and his armies were invading uh, uh, the surrounding monarchies, overthrowing monarchies and establishing republics. And in 1807, he invaded the Iberian Peninsula, ostensibly to Ostensibly, he asked for permission to pass through Spain in order to get to Portugal to overthrow Portugal because Portugal was England's ally. And they had to go through Spain to get their armies to Portugal. However, once in Spain, kind of like the, uh, uh, the story of the scorpion and the tiger crossing a river, once they were in Spain, he couldn't resist overthrowing the Spanish dynasty and removing their king and replacing... Uh, replacing him with his own brother, Jose uh, Bonaparte. 
And then the Spanish didn't like that. They, that's where the, the concept of guerrilla, guerrilla war was invented. Little war. So he was invading through the Iberian Peninsula. He had to pause in Madrid and fight with the Spanish because they were upset that he was, had removed their king. And he was on his way to Portugal. And uh, that would be a disaster for England if he managed to overthrow the, the uh, Portuguese court monarch, the monarchy. So England invited the Portuguese to, to uh, get on a fleet to board ships with uh, English warships guarding them, cross the Atlantic, and establish the Portuguese court, the center of the Portuguese empire in Brazil, as opposed to Portugal. This was not a crazy idea. This had been talked about in Portugal for 50 years before that, because by this time, Brazil was much more prosperous economically than Portugal was. And the, 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 the peso, the weight of uh, the weight of center of gravity had moved to Brazil from Portugal in a number of ways. And here's a picture of Napoleon as he's invading the Iberian Peninsula. So the British came up with this idea. The Portuguese were desperate. So they loaded themselves onto a fleet of ships and with 18,000 uh, Portuguese members of the royal court along with hangers-on and families they boarded ship and sailed for the new world uh the move was unprecedented not only in the history of the americas but in the whole history of colonial exploration for a monarch to move his base of operations to the actual colony instead of the mother country and this was to have many repercussions on the development of brazilian history Never before had a European monarch ever even set foot on the, in a New World colony, much less settled in one as the focus of power. So they first arrived in Bahia, which is in the northeastern part of Brazil, which was the original capital of Brazil. In 1808, the royal entourage sailed on to Rio de Janeiro, and the which was the real administrative center of the colony where the prince regent was determined to settle. And so they had to find housing for 18,000 people. This dislocated a number of residents. Uh, the royal family found itself in a sea of non-white faces. This was uh, a bit of a shock for them. At least two-thirds of the co colony's population was now black, mulatto, or other mixed blood. The court and its hangers-on settled in for an uncomfortable exile of unknown length. So the prince regent lost no time in consolidating the royal presence. Even while he was still in Bahia, he opened the colony's ports to ships of all nations, thus ending three centuries of Portuguese monopoly. This was the beginning of the end of the mercantilist philosophy. It, they deliberately jettisoned the mercantilist mercantilist philosophy that it dictated Portuguese economic policy as well as Spanish economic policy. Uh, once in Rio, the prince founded a bevy of new institutions, including a national library, a botanical garden, the Bank of Brazil, and the medical faculties in Bahia and Rio de Janeiro. The crown also set up the first printing press, delivering the colony from its long intellectual isolation. So you might say that the arrival of the Portuguese court in Rio de Janeiro was good for Brazil. Dom João VI, fearing for the loss of his throne, was forced, felt obligated to return to Portugal several years later. Uh, he actually was reluctant. He loved life in Brazil and didn't want to go back. In April of 1821, he sailed back across the Atlantic. 4,000 Portuguese, less than half the number who had left Lisbon for Brazil in 1808, Accompany the sovereign on his return. He left behind his son Pedro, whom he now named the Prince Regent to administer Brazil. This is Pedro I. Don Juan VI warned his son that if it ever came to a break between those two kingdoms, the prince should choose Brazil. In other words, don't be dumb. Brazil's worth a lot more than Portugal. If they force you to choose, choose Brazil. Wise advice from daddy. So eventually, uh, inevitably, the uh, Portuguese Cortes, Cortes being 
the Cortes in Spain and Portugal was kind of like Parliament in England. The Cortes of Portugal attempted to bring Brazil back under the control of the Portuguese. It's amazing how people never learn the lesson that you can't turn the clock back. Once the cat's out of the bag, it's too late. The Brazilian elite were furious at the suggestion that Brazil's status as a co-kingdom might be revoked. When Dom Juan had gone from Lisbon to Rio de Janeiro, they had created Brazil as a co-kingdom. There was the kingdom of Brazil and the kingdom of Portugal jointly ruled by one monarch instead of Brazil being seen as a colony. Now the Cortes wanted to revert Brazil back into a colony status. That was a bad move and a bad idea. On September 7, 1822, Pedro was forced to make a choice. They wanted him to return. They were pressuring him, and he followed his father's parting advice, wise young man that he was, and said, El Fico. El Fico means I'm staying. Yo me quedo, as he proclaimed Brazil's new independence. And on in December of 1822, he was crowned Emperor Pedro I. Thus did Portuguese America assume a unique historical path, declaring independence the following September. No other former colony has ever embraced its monarch as its monarch, a member of the ruling family of the very country it was rebelling against. This is later what Simon Bolivar precisely wanted for the Spanish America. He felt that they were not ready for democracy and Spanish America needed a strong authority figure. Uh, and this is exactly what Brazil got in Pedro the First. So you would think with this, uh, with Dom Juan opening up the ports of Brazil to laissez-faire uh, free markets and for and the creation of all the institutions and the, the maintenance of unity through a strong executive in Emperor Pedro I, that that would have given Brazil a head start in the race of development as modern nations. However, Brazil has had a number of unresolved questions. Uh, the most important was slavery. The slave trade was Brazil's all-important source of labor and the British were threatening, threatening to cut it off for Brazil, as they'd already done in 1808 for the slave trade to the United States. There's no other country in the Americas that imported more slaves than Brazil did. By percentage of per capita, Cuba might come the closest. Uh, but Brazil absorbed a huge percentage of all the uh, uh, Africans that were forcibly brought from Africa to the Americas to for coerced labor. A second issue was how the monarchy could secure the loyalty of Brazil's scattered provinces, especially where republicanism was very strong as a ideology. That would be in Pernambuco and other parts of the Northeast. The final question was the future of this new country's elite. As we've seen, the Afro-Brazilians, both slave and free, outnumbered the whites as Brazil came, became independent. Social hierarchies. The Brazilian non-elites in 1822 were, were the 95 percent of the population who had neither income nor family connections to rise very far above subsistence. Society was a pyramid. At the bottom were the slaves, both native-born and African-born. Slightly above them were the free men, mostly of color, both free-born and em emancipated slaves. That would include mulattoes, and mestizos. And then at the top you have Creoles who were born in Brazil and Peninsulares who were born in Portugal. They, I think they use different terms in Portuguese than the Spanish terms. So there was a very definite pyramid, social pyramid, and very few people at the top and a lot of people at the bottom. And the new monarchical system uh, it was basically styled after British free market liberalism. The elite in the newly independent nation embraced a version of Manchester liberalism, emanating concurrently from England and already seen in action when the Prince Regent opened Brazil's ports in 1808. The Brazilian elite absorbed much of the political liberalism of Britain. 
This doctrine, impeccable in its logic, meant Brazil would continue to export primary products and import most of its finished goods, which later on the uh, dependistas, the dependency theorists, will say is the recipe for dependency. Since tariffs, according to this doctrine, could only be levied for revenue, protecting the nascent domestic industrialization efforts from foreign competition was out of the question. And later in this course, we'll talk about uh, the uh, protectionism, uh, level, uh, levying uh, tariffs in order to protect certain manufacturing industries uh, that are national to give them a chance to grow and establish themselves in competition with international competitors. Brazil had to come to terms with the facts that Great Britain was now the guarantor of Brazil's survival as a new nation. Although the U.S. recognition of Brazilian independence came first in 1824, Britain was still the leading European power of the day, and so its action in 1825 would be more crucial. Later on with the Monroe Doctrine, the United States will encourage Brazil to back out and leave it to the United States to exercise, throw its weight around and exercise protection. But this is before that uh, day has come. Portugal's political alliance with Britain went back to the 14th century. By the 18th century, Britain was Portugal's most important trading part partner. And the Royal Navy had saved the Portuguese crown from capture and deposition by Napoleon's armies, thus guaranteeing a new importance for Brazil. And British Great Britain was going to be economically dominant, not only uh, in Europe and most of the world, but also particularly in Brazil. The British support did not come cheap. Uh, in 1825, Brazil agreed to pay the 7 million uh, Cruzeiros debt to Portugal uh, that Portugal had incurred with Britain to finance the fight against uh, Brazilian independence. Second, there was another treaty in 1825 continuing to grant British goods preferential tariffs in Brazil at lower rates than that charged to the Portuguese. In 1826, there was a treaty for forcing Brazil to commit itself to ending the African slave trade within a few years. That didn't happen. It had to wait another 60 years, actually. The Brazilian legislation of 1831 reluctantly uh, passed a law banning the trade, but the failure to enforce it made the ban ineffectual. Finally, Brazilians signed a treaty in 1827, giving British subjects the right to be tried by special British courts within Brazil. So Brazil was pretty dominant uh, in Brazil, with relation to Brazil. All these measures underline the fact that the British were now the dominant foreign actor in the Brazilian economy, both in trade and direct investment. They were supreme in banking, shipping, communications, and insurance. Brazil had passed from the Portuguese crown to the British sphere of influence in what historians would later call informal imperialism. You might compare this. This was 1808 to the 1820s, but this could be compared with what happened 80 years later in Cuba when Cuba passed from the Spanish uh, imperialism to the informal imperialism of the United States. Okay, that's it for the independence of Brazil. It's almost a shame to cover such a vast topic in such a short time, but that's what we have. And so I hope you'll enjoy this. I hope you'll read the chapter, and I'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Take care.